If Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year, you could call these few weeks after Christmas the most introspective time of the year. Hi, I'm Rob West. This is a time when we can resolve to live with greater faith and purpose, and this should include our investing. I'll talk about that today with Jason Meyer, and then it's on to your calls at 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. This is Faith and Finance, biblical wisdom for your financial journey. Well, it's always great to have Jason Meyer on the program. He's the executive director of the Eventide Center for Faith and Investing, an educational initiative of Eventide Asset Management and an underwriter of this program. Jason, great to have you back with us. Hey, good to be with you again, Rob. Thanks. Jason, in the spirit of the new year, I understand that you have a personal reflection and even a goal-setting exercise for us today, which I'm excited about. Is that right? (laughs) That's right. Uh, You know, one of the things I'm really thankful for is just new cycles of time and life that allow us fresh vision for our lives. And I think about uh, Lamentations says the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. And if they're new every morning, uh, how much more are they new with each new year that we're granted life? So, I hope everybody's just filled with fresh hope and encouragement at the brand new mercies of God on offer today. Amen. All right. So why don't you dive in? What do you have for us? Yeah. So I'd like to take advantage of the new year for some personal assessments and goal setting. Now, I don't know if you've ever done one of these new year assessments, but if you have, you'll know that many of the tools out there kind of encourage us to break down our lives into different categories for reflection. So maybe a finances category a faith or spirituality category, an area to think about our work goals, our family life, our health, et cetera. And breaking things down like this into separate categories can help us in isolating those parts of our lives for closer examination and reflection, but it can also create divisions between our faith and these other parts of our lives, which are not really separate. So, for example, we can assess our finances separate from our faith, which can lead us to mess of course, the ways in which financial decisions can have very real moral and spiritual dimensions to them, which I know is yeah. something that you talk a lot about uh, here on the program. Yes. Well, that's exactly right. So faith should really be the lens through which we consider all areas of our life. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly right. We need to have faith be the guide through this whole process. And um, in my world, which is investing, that's really where I want us to focus today. But it's an area that is, I think, especially resistant to this kind of faith examination. Um, Just to give you uh, an example here, you know, if if we were to ask the typical person to kind of make a personal assessment of how they think their investing is going, I think most people's minds would go to really just questions like, am I saving enough for the future, for retirement? That's the question we're always hit with in education today, and I know we all probably feel behind and bad about that. And that's not a bad question, of course. It just, it can sometimes uh, fail to get us uh, beyond the superficial to really examining some of the hard issues that are there. Um, now, of course, it does, uh, investing does require diligence and sacrifice and planning. So there are some spiritual dimensions there, but I, hopefully you get my point. Sure. Now, I, I think even when we do bring the spiritual questions to bear on our investing, we can still stay at a very high level. So if I were to ask, how would you would do a spiritual assessment of your investing? You know, a lot of people there consider questions really about greed and just how much they've given themselves over to uh, kind of the distorted vision of retirement and the American dream and uh, living only for ourselves and things like that. And while that's also important, Really what I'm hoping for is that we can uh, press beyond that and to ask something even more fundamental about the very companies that we're supporting in our investing. Yeah, it's really helpful, Jason. And the good news is there are more opportunities than ever to allow your faith to be aligned with your investments, your deployment of capital. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. And there are many faith-guided, faith-based investments on offer today that can help us uh, on the back half of such an assessment. 
Well, after this break, we're going to dive into that and perhaps look at a better way to assess our investing that gets us deeper into the heart issues. Jason will actually unpack this process that you can apply to your own investing. We're joined by Jason Meyer, Executive Director of the Eventide Center for Faith and Investing, an educational initiative of Eventide Asset Management. Much more on faith and finance just around the corner. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We are grateful for support from LightPoint Portfolios, which seeks out family and faith-friendly investments for 401k and 403b plans, integrating faith values and fiduciary duty. LightPoint Portfolios offers retirement plans for a variety of organizations such as businesses, nonprofits, and churches. And we're grateful for their sponsorship of the MoneyWise program. More information is available at LightPointPortfolios.com. What if buying groceries, gas, or dining out could help change lives? With Christian Community Credit Union's Cards That Give to Missions, you can help spread the gospel, combat human trafficking, and protect vulnerable children with every purchase at no cost to you. Apply for your card today. More information is available at joinchristiancommunity.com. That's joinchristiancommunity.com. The Credit Union is an underwriter of this ministry. Membership eligibility required. Thanks for joining us today on Faith and Finance. I'm joined today by Executive Director of the Eventide Center for Faith and Investing, Jason Meyer. We're delighted you're with us today. We're talking about a process that you can use to reflect and perhaps even evaluate your investing in light of your faith. You know, so often when we think about evaluating our finances, we might think about a numerical evaluation. How are we doing toward our goals? But what about faith alignment as it relates to our investment? Well, Jason is going to help us dive into this particular area with a process, perhaps, Jason, a better way to assess our investing that gets us deeper into the heart issues, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And what I want to share with you is actually an investing examination that came to me by a person named Ben Nicka, who's one of the contributing authors at the Eventide Center for Faith and Investing. I just really like his framework. And so here's the way uh, it goes. I'll I'll describe it to you. At the end, I'll give you a link to a worksheet you can fill out. But it's very simple. It starts by first writing down all your investments, your stock investments, bonds, cash, whatever you have, real estate, and the rough percentage that you have allocated to each. And then next to each of these categories to write down a sentence, just detailing the rationale as to why you have that investment composition that you have there. Now, uh, just to give you uh, an illustration of this, I'm going to use Ben Nick's responses that he gave me from a a, a prior year where he did this. So here, listen to his as you think about your own. So he has an investment in cash, 20%. This is held at Synchrony Bank, which uh, is convenient for him, and uh, he says pays high interest rates. And 20% allocation to cash may seem high, but he's rather skeptical about the markets these days, and he's also saving up for a down payment. So next category, stocks, 40%. And he holds these in low-fee index funds. And the rationale here is, in in his thinking, that index funds have generally been shown uh, to outperform most active asset managers when you consider fees, and uh, they're recommended by people like Warren Buffett. Bonds, 20% held in mutual funds. This allocation is, again, perhaps a little high for Ben's age, but again, reflects his skepticism about the markets these days. And finally, he has a cash balance pension plan for the final 20% of his investments. Ben's a very fortunate person to have such a benefit at his employer, very rare, yeah. and he really has no idea uh, the way in which that pension plan is invested. So that's part one. Yeah, that's really helpful as a breakdown. Uh, what else can we glean from this, though? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I think you can see is just most of the time when we're thinking about our investing, the logic is pretty straightforward around just just our thoughts on the macro environment and the health of the economy and our own appetite for risk sure. and our need for a return. Now, I want to just move on to this, the part two of this exercise, 
uh, which I think will bring greater clarity, and it's to make a second list. Okay. Okay? So we got our investing list. On the second list, what you do is you write down all of your philanthropic investing, all right. including the rationale, just like you did with your investments. And again, I'm going to use Ben's list for illustration purposes. So 70% of his giving goes to his local church. All right. His local church plays an irreplaceable role in his family's life and the lives of other families. He's very proud of his church. 23% of his giving goes to the disadvantaged and unfortunate. So he gives to a couple of ministries, uh, Open Hands Legal Services, which does some legal representation in New York City, a city he has connections to. And it pushes back on law abuses that exploit the needy. He also gives to Jericho Ministries and Com- Community Emergency Service, which is in Minneapolis, another city he's connected to. And they provide services uh, for the needy, both materially and spiritually. Uh, 7% giving goes to an area called Practical Theology, which is some Christian counseling resources uh, from people like Dr. David Pallison. And finally, he gives some miscellaneous gifts, uh, ad hoc from bonus and tax returns and things like that. And that goes to uh, a few ministries, both in New York and the Minnesota area. Now, the introspective question is to compare the two lists Hmm. and to ask yourself, what do you notice when you're looking at these two lists and the motives as to why you're allocating dollars in those directions? Yeah, and it's clearly a very different thought process for each list, right? That's right. So for Ben's philanthropic investments, he has a very detailed, I actually left out a lot of detail, a very detailed understanding of the activities of each organization he supports and morally approves of them, even is very proud of them, and he believes they contribute to the flourishing of society and to justice in our world. And if these organizations were to turn from their core convictions and commitments, Ben conveyed to me that he would immediately cease his investments. Now, if you contrast that to the investing side of the ledger and the stocks and bonds, et cetera, there he has no knowledge of the companies that he is supporting through his investments, much less their activities. Of course, why? Uh, Because he's using investment products, things like index funds, uh, which are a very uh, passive approach to investing. He's really handed over the responsibility of choosing those specific companies. And uh, he's really aligned with just the broader success of the market generally. Uh, Ben notes that his approach to investing is also morally passive in that it entails uh, a kind of simple indifference to the moral quality of the the work performed by the companies that he's investing in, the companies inside of the investments. So his investment strategy is really only about risk, return, convenience. And uh, one of the comments he made to me is that if he stayed invested this way, uh, he will have supported these unknown companies for nearly 50 years without mm. truly knowing or engaging in the inherent good or bad of their products and services, how they impact customers, employees, suppliers, communities, environment, etc. Now, Ben's investments here are pretty typical, I would say, yeah. in the sense that most of us really don't know what's going on inside of our investments. And I think it can highlight to us the way in which we might need to consider how to bring that into the picture. This is all really helpful, Jason. So how can our listeners use this assessment as they step into a new year? Yeah, hopefully you'll do the exercise, and hopefully this exercise reveals to you uh, the way in which you choose your investments and the way in which you give your money, and the way in which the motivations there should share uh, some, some commonalities. While it's certainly appropriate and essential to consider the risk and return for our investing decisions, this exercise also highlights a common blind spot, I think, in investing today, namely that we often fail to consider the impact that our investing is having on the world with very real and moral, uh, very real uh, moral and spiritual dimensions there. And so this investing exercise, I think, should just lead us to ask a basic question. In this new year, how can my investing choices be guided more by my faith. And um, really, the goal is to consider the ways in which our investing dollars are already having an impact and how we can do that to an even greater degree that aligns with, with God's vision for business and the world. 
Yeah, to this point, it seems like to most investors that this area of our financial lives was just off limits. There was nothing we could do to really align it with our faith. And what you're telling us is there's an entirely different opportunity. So how can folks get more information about faith-guided investing, Jason? They can go to faithandinvesting.com slash faith buy. There you'll find the worksheet and resources for faithful investing. That's great. Again, that's faithandinvesting.com slash faith buy. That's faith, F-I. Faithandinvesting.com slash faith buy. Jason, thanks for being with us today, my friend. Thanks. My pleasure. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Much more to come. Forty-five thousand. That's how many times Faith and Finance referred a listener to a certified kingdom advisor last year. And for good reason. These are trusted financial, legal, and accounting professionals who have completed a rigorous certification program to ensure biblically wise financial advice as part of their practice. You can find a local CKA professional in your area by going to faithfi.com and clicking on the Find a CKA button on the homepage. My name is Kent, and I'm a member of Christian Healthcare Ministries. I have a friend who actually has great insurance, and she recently had a a life-threatening experience. And she was laying in the hospital bed afraid, not afraid for her life, but afraid of what her insurance would or would not cover. And as a CHM member, I can honestly say I just never have that fear. I can't tell you the, the peace of mind that provides. Learn more about Christian Healthcare Ministries' biblical cost sharing at chministries.org. Welcome back to Faith and Finance. I'm Rob West, your host, taking your calls and questions today, 800-525-7000. Well, we'll be going to Texas and talking with Charlie in just a moment, but first to Austin, Texas, and Lewis. Go right ahead, sir. Uh, Hi. Uh, We have a question about faith-based investing. We're uh, in our late 50s, early 60s, and in a position to own our homestead free and clear, and feel that the time is right to uh, liquidate some some long-held real estate investments. And some of that obviously would reduce the last bit of our debt, but we're particularly interested in some faith-based investing strategies, portfolios, things like that. We have a longstanding uh, relationship with Morgan Stanley, but they don't seem to have any baskets of funds or anything uh, that that we could, that can kind of point us in that direction. So that's, that's our question, if that makes any sense. Yeah, very good, Lewis. Well, I'm glad you're thinking about this. This is an exciting and growing segment of the investment landscape. I would say two things with regard to your question. First is, uh, you know, as you liquidate these properties, if you want to do any giving out of the proceeds of this, you may want to check with our friends at the National Christian Foundation to see about gifting even a portion of this property to a donor advised fund prior to the sale, which could give you some tax advantages and create some funds that could be then given away to ministry or your church. Uh, but with that portion that you recognize as a, as a proceeds, um, if you want to redeploy that, I love the idea of you thinking about a faith-based investing strategy. And I would think about it in two ways. Uh, number one would be the avoid bucket. And the, the other, uh, the second would be uh, the embrace bucket. Let me explain those. So avoid just simply says there are certain companies we want to avoid with our investments because either their primary business activity or their corporate profits are used for things that don't align with your values as a Christian. And so you want to screen those companies out. And that's very possible today. Um, or embracing other companies. The idea there is that uh, you want to look at the social or the kingdom impact that a company is making as a result of the work they're doing, and you want to specifically invest in, uh, or an investment manager on your behalf, specifically invest in those companies that are um, making, uh, you know, the world rejoice, uh, promoting human flourishing and uh, the expansion of God's kingdom. You know, I think both of those are available to you and they can be done 
together. So the next question is then where do you go? Um, in terms of how you deploy this, you've got a couple of options, Lewis. One is you could make direct investments in these fund families uh, that are listed on the site, or you could connect with a certified kingdom advisor there in Austin, and you'd want to ask the CKA um, whether he or she is able to deploy a faith-based investing strategy, either on the embrace side or the avoid side or both. Uh, not all of them do. Some of them do more traditional type investments, but others uh, are specialists in this type of investing. And um, I will say that some of these fund families that uh, I mentioned are even available at Morgan Stanley. So you would need an advisor who understands that, but he or she should be able to access uh, some of these fund families even on that platform. I've thrown a lot at you, though. Do you have any follow-up questions? Well, just one one last question, and thank you for the information. If if I was if I was to transfer, you know, basically close the Morgan Stanley account and transfer somewhere else, does that create a taxable event, or is there some kind of a well? period of time where I can make that transfer without it being a taxable event. Yeah. What type of accounts are these? Are they taxable accounts or are uh, they retirement accounts like yeah, IRAs? Yeah, you know, I've got a SEP IRA and got some Roths yeah. and uh, some rollover IRAs, that kind of thing. Okay. So there would be no taxable event occurring inside those accounts because you could open a new Roth or a new SEP or a new traditional at another custodian, and then you would liquidate those investments that are currently held in those accounts at the existing custodian, but that doesn't generate any tax uh, because it's inside of a retirement vehicle until you take a withdrawal, and you're not going to. In this case, you would just simply liquidate the holdings, and then the assets would transfer from from one IRA to another, which doesn't create a taxable event. Um, and that's the beauty of those retirement accounts. Uh, so SEP, Roth, uh, traditional, all would be included in that. Do you follow? Yes, I do. Well, thank you very much. Okay. And I uh, appreciate the information. You're welcome. Happy to do it. Just go to faithfi.com, click learn, and then start reading up on it. And then connect with a certified kingdom advisor. And I think uh, you'll be headed in the right direction. And, you know, this is an area of the investment universe that I'm really excited about because we're seeing incredible flows as Christians are made aware that their values can be reflected in their investments, not just their planning and the decisions they're making with God's money, but their investments too, they're really uh, moving a lot of money into these investments. We're going to see a lot of impact as a result. We appreciate your call today. I hope that helps. Quickly to Brenda in Arkansas. You'll be our final final caller today. Brenda, how can I help you? Okay. Uh, first of all, I listen to your show all the time, and I just love it and, and great advice. Thank now, you. my problem is I've been retired about six years. My husband was retired uh, and was receiving uh, Social Security. He recently passed away, and I've been trying to um, get his Social Security, and they refused me every time. And I'm not quite understanding why I'm not allowed to, um, you know, as his legal wife, to get his social security. Uh, yes. Um, have, have you remarried Brenda? No, 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 okay. not at all. We, we've been married. Um, you know, he just recently passed away. So <laughs> we okay. were married all, at the, at the time that, of his passing. No, I've yes. never, no. Okay. And have you talked to the social security administration to ask what it is that's preventing you from collecting survivors benefits? Um, well, they say, um, because I was a teacher, teachers didn't pay into social security that okay. I was not eligible. Okay. All right. And that, that could be exactly it. Um, what, let's do this. You hold the line. We'll talk a bit more off the air. Unfortunately, we're out of time today. I know that can be frustrating. We want to help you get to the bottom of it. So we appreciate your call. Just stay right there. We'll talk a bit more off the air. Well, every day we talk about what the Bible has to say about money and how important it is to plan for how we manage it. 
If you haven't already done so, let me recommend that you check out the free FaithFi app and let it help you start on building a plan and working that plan so you control your money rather than it controlling you. You can find links to it on our website at faithfi.com. That's faithfi.com. I'm Rob West. Many thanks for listening today, and I hope you'll join us again next time right here on Faith and Finance.